right, I'm going to just navigate over to the actual um, uh, broadcast live control room on YouTube, and we should be live. Give me one second, Dr. Madden, sorry. Sure. And we're live. All right. Dr. All right. Madden, thank you so much for coming back on the show again for another episode of Conversations with Catholics. I think you and I are going to talk some nominalism stuff today. Uh, I think let's that's do it. Let's talk, let's talk nominalism. All yeah, right. Sure. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, I've been perhaps publishing a few um, provocative, maybe I'll call them, videos uh, where my my main point has been, I guess there's a few main points. Um, number one, I view nominalism as a relatively serious um, uh, uh, hurdle on the, the road to Rome. Um, I, sure. I think that that might be something that should actually give Catholics some real something something to really think about before they uh, you know fully admit to to um, the realist position. Uh, something else I've I've argued is that I think that just like with a application of Occam's razor, I think it makes a lot of sense to be a nominalist. Um, and then third, well, actually, that's the origin of the term. Yes, right? Occam <laughs> yeah, okay, himself yeah. was the OG yeah, nominalist. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I guess my third point too was that it's um, uh, there is a nominalism phobia that seems to be kind of in the air. I think it's been in the air for probably over a hundred years at this point. Um, yeah. But it almost seems nominalism almost seems to be the scapegoat for a lot of um, uh, anything that's going wrong in the world. It's the fault of nominalism, and I just don't right. think that's right. fair. Uh, but I, that's a lot for us to talk about. Um, and, and cards on the table right at the beginning, I do call myself a nominalist and the only kind of, um, asterisk that I'll put there is that, uh, I'm not a very bright person and my mind changes all the time. And so, um, uh, my, I, I call myself a nominalist now, but that's subject to change at the drop of a dime. Um, sure. but I do call myself a nominalist. So cool. now that the table is set, I kind of just want to ask you, um, what do you, how do you feel about Occam? Is everything Occam's fault? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I do, and I want to be careful because, like, I have very good friends, very, very good friends, people I respect seriously intellectually, who, you know, like really will say it all went wrong with Occam, right? And that's probably overstates your position, okay? But, um, so I want to be careful, right? But I do, I do think there is this, the kind of strange tendency to like kind of like to see Occam or medieval late medieval nominalism as you know like the absolute beginning of the downfall of western civilization or something like that and then we're going to like and you and you'll get people saying like you know we can draw a line from nominalism to the reformation we can draw a line from the reformation to like fascism and all these things okay and there's these are very very you know tenuous historical narratives right it doesn't mean they're false but they're very tenuous i think OK. And I think there's questions of like, OK, how much influence does something like the academic philosophy of you know the medieval university have over the over the civilization in general? It's a question and, and, and whether all that's fair and all that. OK. So a lot of that, though, I, I would rather leave to historians to sort out because that's going to go way over my pay grade in a hurry. Right. Same. OK. And, and I'll even say this is, that, as you know, I am not afraid to get out of my like narrow academic lane, but I do like to let people know when I'm doing it. Right. And so I'm not, I'm not a medievalist, right. I'm not, I'm not per se an expert on the medieval problem of universals, realism, anomalism. Um, you know, I have taught a course on it, but only once. Right. And, but you know, it's something that well, actually I had a graduate seminar on it too. And um, so it's something I, I think I can, I can, clarify a bit but i mean once again there are experts on this that could correct me but that being said i'm gonna like i'm gonna say what i think now okay so um and and the, my take on a lot of it i think is just less rides on it than is made out on either side of the issue okay um so maybe like why don't we why don't we like we kind of go back and like yeah. really look at what the the original problem was that realism and nominalism were sort of addressing yeah yeah let's do it okay yeah okay so if you're really going to do this right you go back to aristotle's categories okay all right because um and you know what is aristotle's categories aristotle's categories is the it's traditionally what's you know he's he's addressing what is called the first act of the mind 
right, in traditional classical Aristotelian logic, okay? And for, probably first and second acts, okay? So, and it's a question of what is going on when we predicate something, okay? So when I say all S are P, right? All things in the subject class are members of the predicate class, or I say some S are P, like what am I actually doing there? Okay, what am I saying? And like, what are the ontological commitments that come with it? All right. Now, the idea here, though, is is we're building this sort of basic predication with an interest to like take these propositions we're building so we can put them into syllogisms, right? That will redu that will like then play a role in deductively sound Aristotelian science. Okay. Now, right there, you have to know like that's what this logic is intended for, like for, for induct, re, deductively sound Aristotelian science. And if you're not doing Aristotelian science, there's a question of like what role any of this plays now, okay? Um, and so if I say, and I hope this isn't like difficult for the listeners because you know, it would help to have like a whiteboard, but um, if I say, you know, all uh, S are M, okay? All M are T, okay? we would like to be able to infer all SRT from that as a, as a deductively valid syllogism, okay? Now, M, there's my middle term, all right? Now, in order for that to work, though, what I mean by M in both of its occurrences in that syllogism has to be exactly the same, right? For that to be a deductively valid result, like the when I say M in the first premise and I say M in the second premise in the major and the minor, I have to actually be applying that term in ex with exactly the same sense. Okay. And so then there's this need to have, in order to have deductively valid syllogisms, there's a need to have um, absolute univocal predication going on in the two instances of the middle term. Does that make sense? And that's where the universal concept becomes like useful. Useful. Yeah. Useful. Right. And that's where if there aren't universal concepts, like absolutely locked down, because like deductive inference has to be absolutely locked down. Right. There's mm -hmm. no wiggle room. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you're going to have absolutely locked down, non-trivial deductive inferences, then there have to be these universal concepts that are absolutely univocal across all their applications. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and if not, then it would seem all of your syllogisms now are not deductive, but they're at some level inductive, right? There's, there's no inference then that is absolutely certain deductively, right? Except for like pure trivialities, right? Right. If you're going to have law of identity if, or something like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you're going to have, um, absolute certainty in inference, right? You need these universal concepts that are univocally, right? Um, applied throughout the syllogism. And if, and if you're going to say these ground a science, right, I mean, meaning a way of getting the world right, then you're going to have to say that those universal concepts apply not just univocally in your syllogism, but they apply univocally to the objects you're reasoning about. Okay. So then it seems like you have to have an absolute universal categorization of things that the concepts, the predicates showing up in your logic have a kind of identity relationship to. Okay. And so voila, it looks like that concept has to go, it can't just be, what is it, um, ex parte mens on the side of mind, right? It's got to be ex parte re. Now, it's about all the Latin I know if I'm even getting that right. Okay. <laughs> it be like ex parte re. It's got to be in the world too. It's got to somehow be grounded in the things, okay? So now suddenly it looks like universals have to have an ontology over and above the particulars if you're going to have deductively sound scientific inferences, right? And so just to make sure that I'm following and maybe, th yeah. maybe this will help the audience too. What we're saying here is something to the effect of if we're trying to say that it's true that, and just, you know, bear with me on this one, all apples are red. I know not all, all sure. apples are red, but yeah, it doesn't uh, matter. Yeah. If, if it is going to be true, then uh, the redness has to be like an actual part of the world, not just something in our mind, but there must right. be something real right. about redness yeah. uh, by which all apples participate in it. Because there's a halfway, there's a halfway position here called conceptualism. Okay, and I think at some point in his career, right, once again, experts are out there, correct me, I think some points in his career, we would have called Occam a conceptualist, where he's saying, yeah, we've got on the side of the mind, 
there are universe, absolute universal identical concepts that, that are driving the reasoning, but they might not have a completely tight fit to what's going on in the world. Okay, so we can do our deductive reasoning, but it could be like ultimately kind of like falsified by what's going on in the world. And we have to like revise the concepts. Okay. Um, and that got that, that solves the problem of like how does like our empirical experience somehow magically, you know, or metaphysically result in these universals that are have an identity relation with, with the world. Okay. And so, and so you're saying that, that and that's a, that's typically taken as a kind of nominalism, conceptualism, right? Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is, and you're right, if you're going to go all the way and say you've got a mind world fit such that we can reason with deductive soundness about the world, the realist is going to argue the only way that's going to work is if you have these universal concepts that are, that have an identity as they as they show up in the mind and as they show up, and they have to show up in the world somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just a quick, maybe preemptive question. And if you want to hold off mm -hmm. on getting here, then, yeah, then please do. But um, when we're talking about these universals that really are in the world in some way, we're kind of talking both about like the Platonists and the moderate realists here, because yeah. the moderate realists will still say that there is something real about redness. The only difference between the two is that the Platonists will say that there's like this, you know, ethereal um, redness that exists yeah. kind of independent of the particulars, while yeah. the moderate realists, which most Catholics are probably going to be moderate realists, um, the moderate realists will say that the redness is inside the apple. Like it's, it's, uh, yeah. but that's exactly. it. And, you know, and you definitely call it Platonist because it's what everybody does. But I think that's like unfair to Plato. Okay. Right. So I don't, I don't think Plato is a Platonist, but, but that, that's for another, that's for, <laughs> okay. that's another, okay. that's, that's for another day. We can do that another day. Right. I'm happy to do that. But okay. So like, like, like so I, I guess we would say Aquinas is a moderate realist. Okay. And really Thomas, I mean, Thomas, we missed this. Like he was racy. Like he was, he was not a well-behaved guy for his era, right? Yeah. And he he pushed this thing as close to nominalism as you can get without going all the way, right? And he's influenced by some of the great like Muslim thinkers on this, right? And in Thomas's view, the essence, okay, in the mind is universal in actuality, but in the thing, it's universal only in potential, okay? Um, now we can like ask ourselves like, how intelligible it is to say that and like isn't aren't we kind of just inventing statuses to solve problems okay but but i want people to see like thomas is like he's kind of got you know like 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 a really um radical realism doesn't really pass the sniff test for thomas very well right like he's trying to like tone this down a little bit okay and to say yeah th he doesn't think there are universals are sort of like substances out there in the world like if you're going to count the things in the world you'd count the the particulars then you count on top of the universals right the the essence for him is universal only as cognized okay but that but that is a way the particular can the essence of the particular can be okay so you'll say the the essence of the particular is particular as a constituent of the particular but once cognized, it becomes universal, right? Becomes is maybe a, a rough word there, such that in the universal that you and I are cognizing now, there is an identity between the essence of that thing and all the other particulars. Okay. So yeah, so maybe maybe Thomas's moderate realism is um, like more moderate than uh, more moderate than real almost. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and you can see, like, it, it's a, it's really just over the line from conceptualism to realism. Right, right? yeah. Because you'll say, as cognized, the essence is universal. Mm -hmm. As a constituent of the thing, it's particular. Mm -hmm. But those are two modes of being of the same thing, mm -hmm. the essence. Yeah. And the, be the essence can have, it has a mode of being for Thomas as a particular in the thing and as a universal as cognized. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And once again, we're like, we're adding a lot of apparatus here. Okay. And, and, and that apparatus doesn't seem to really do any work, but to solve this problem. So there's a worry like, Hey, well, if we could get by without that apparatus, why would we do it? Okay. But that, but I want people to see like Thomas's positions, like it, it's, it's a very interesting kind of borderline between the conceptualist and, and the, um, and, and the realist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so at this point, does it maybe make sense to talk a moment about Occam and yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and where where Occam's razor may just kind of shave off all of these apparatus that Thomas just so very carefully crafted for us so that we can actually kind of preserve this this realism. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, um, OK, that'll be harder for me because I know less about Occam. But uh, you so, know more than I do. <laughs> yeah. but the, th the thing is, is in, and I actually think um, the place that it's very interesting to look at this is David Hume. OK. OK. Um, but and I think actually really what you're getting in Hume in many ways is a simplified, warmed over Occam. OK, because because Occam does tend towards a kind of empiricism. He tends towards a fairly radical empiricism. Yes. Right. All right. And and Occam is sort of troubled about like how you get particular in but universal out from sense perception. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and in and and that that troubles Occam. Right. And he's thinking, well, you have to sort of invent like a special process wherein that happens. And Occam's just asking, can we make sense of inference? Can we make sense of reasoning? Can we make sense of logic without adding an extra process whereby the universal is abstracted from the particular, right? And, and so, and the thing is, is Occam had a long career and you can find almost every version of nominalism at some point the guy held, whether it's yes. conceptualism or it's like radical nominalism, or everything in between. And, um, you know, so basically like, you know, like, you know so Occam is going to say, well, do we really need to posit universality over and above just similarity? Okay. Like, is it enough to say M as the middle term appearing in the major premise and M as appearing in the, as the middle term in the minor premise, is it, do they really have to be identical or wouldn't similar be enough to ground the inference? Right. And um, and so in Occam's view, you don't need the absolute identity. Similarity is enough. And he thinks like, say, similarity is a notion that we're already well acquainted with that we like empirically that we don't need to add to. OK, now, in fairness to like the, the opponents of Occam, OK, well, similar in terms of what it seems like, like there is maybe a concept in the background there. Right. But for everything, what Occam's going to what all his versions of, of novels are going to say, well, look, isn't aren't there just sort of better known notions that we could use to ground the predication that would still get us all the inferences we want without adding any more metaphysical apparatus. Is, is that a fair way to, you know? and, and yeah, and that's, that's pretty much um, like where I, you know, again, putting my cards on the table when I kind of look at all of this stuff. And again, my, my background being engineering, not philosophy. Yeah. I'm, I'm fairly close to some kind of radical empiricism myself. Um, yeah. And so when I read, about Occam and just the, hey, look, we really don't need to posit these seemingly unfalsifiable entities in order to make sense of the world around us. I say, great, let's let's not then. Let's just not posit them. Yeah. That's it. So it's yeah. it's almost like um like you'll you'll hear um a lot of atheists will talk about atheism as if it's like a lack of the like a lack theism. Now yeah. I understand that's not how the word is used in in philosophy textbooks, but um right, right. that's almost how I feel about um about like realism. Like I, I just lack this positive belief in realism because I don't, I don't think I need it to make sense of the world. Um, right. So that, right. that's kind of where I find yeah. myself. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think an interesting pushback, especially for um, a guy like you, who's an engineer and like really wants to apply mathematics uh, to the, to the physical world. Right. Is, do you think though that you make, deductively valid inferences that are, you know, empirically significant. Um, in like a fictionalist way. Yes. Yeah. But I don't think I would be, um, I don't think that I'm actually like, uh, happy to say strictly speaking that, you know, all apples are red. Like, I don't, I don't think, yeah. I don't yeah. think that I can actually say that. Um, even, even if I can say, you know, um, something similar. Like if I can even say just like, you know, yeah. adding like a fictionalist kind of asterisk to the, to yeah. the, to the, what red is, then I'm happy. But, um, yeah. And, and nominalism does make me uncomfortable, especially like nominalism about mathematics. Like the fact that the, the yeah. nominalist kind of has to say that strictly speaking, one plus one does not equal two because one and two both don't really exist. Um, like yeah. that makes me pretty uncomfortable or, or at the very least, like we don't have to, <laughs> We don't have to say we're using mathematical terms univocally in order to make the arguments go, right? But then what's going to happen is even at a certain level, like this is where like Quine, the great 20th century 
Anglo-American philosopher goes is to say, well, then, yeah, it looks like all of our deductions are not deductions. They're all inductions. Yeah. They're, they're all they're all based on concepts that are revisable. And they're all things that under certain conditions we might give them up if, if the right empirical circumstances came up. Yeah. Right. And if you're, I think if you're going to bite that bullet, I don't think there's any realist reply. That, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, what, what the realist will do is argue, look, don't you have a self-reference problem there? Like, don't you need a deductive argument, a, 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 like a, like a, an ontologically significant deductive argument, a non-trivial deductive, deductive argument to like argue for your nominalism. Okay. And, and I'm not so sure that's true. Like you could be saying, right. Like the, your nominalism is itself a kind of hypothesis, right. That, that could be refuted. I don't know what that would look like. Okay. But I, I do think you could have an, I think this is kind of what Hume's up to, right. Is to say, look, I don't know, maybe, maybe something could come along that would change my mind on this. Uh, and I don't claim to have a deductive certainty of my anomalism. It's just that I can get by with it and I'm not going to like go put anything in there that I don't need to, to get by. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now with, with all of this, um, in mind, so it, it, you and I right now have been talking, we, we kind of set the stage with, um, like, Hey, well, like, why, why might we want to posit universals? And then we kind of moved into why might not we need to, if we're willing to bite the bullet. Um, yeah, I think though, um, that's, that's kind of the whole first part of the, the conversation is like, you know, um, are, are you willing to bite the bullet kind of, and I have, I've, yeah. I've, I've bitten the bullet. I'm not. Yeah. So let me, yeah, go ahead. I want to like point if, if you're willing to accept a kind of skepticism. Okay. And I, by that, I don't mean like, uh, you know, a uh, simulation hypothesis, it's all a dream kind of skepticism. But what I mean is if you're willing to accept that we do not have like absolute certainty about anything that we're like getting via inference, okay, and you, and, but you're even, admit, even that is something you're not absolutely sure of. Like you're willing to like accept, accept a kind of unsurety about things, mm -hmm. right? I don't think there's a really like knockdown argument against the anomalous position. Mm, okay. I, does that make sense? It, yeah. So it, it does, but it actually opens up a lot of questions for me. Yeah. Um, and for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so I guess the first thing that comes to mind and I'm going to come at you from my trad Catholic upbringing perspective now. Yeah. Do it. Um, do it. And that's just that. Um, okay. Here's how transubstantiation is defined. The substance mm -hmm of bread leaves the accidents of the bread, but the substance of the body, blood, soul, and divinity comes into the bread. Um, that is tra like trans substance yeah. kind of doesn't make any sense in light of nominalism. Um, so it almost seems like if somebody does bite that bullet, oh, how, ooh, how do you make sense of yeah. transubstantiation now? And I do know that the Jesuits are actually doing some pretty interesting work on this. Like, yeah transubstantiation in light of nominalism but when i'm calling it interesting work i'm struggling to find like a uh a, like a steel man way to phrase it but a lot of it is kind of like an appeal to mystery which just leaves yeah. me right me me the engineer the you know kind of yeah, just yeah. deeply unsatisfied with that answer yeah. um and then i kind of just walk away going like well if i need to like appeal to mystery to make light of something when I seemingly can just say like, well, I, I don't have to make, I don't, I don't have to, like, I, I can look at transubstantiation and just say, no, like there's, there's no universals. Transubstantiation, um, might mean something to somebody, um, in like a, uh, non-literal way, but, but literally speaking, substances don't exist. The accidents of the bread are there. Ac accidents are all that exist. Yeah. So, so that's it. I don't, there's nothing for yeah. me to explain. Um, but I might wonder, you know, in light of what we've just been talking about, yeah. um, how the Catholic might want to respond to that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, how the Catholic responds to it might be different from how Jim responds to it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sure. okay. This is where I get myself in trouble, right? But um, so, I mean, first of all, I guess I, I, I hate to answer a question with a question, Kevin, mm -hmm. but I always, I always yell at my students for doing that. <laughs> but but um, I don't quite see why one needs a robust 
form of realism to make transubstantiation work. I mean, don't we just need to be able to say like there, there's a difference between the surface features of a thing and like the underlying grounding features of the thing such that there's like a conceptual space where the one could change without the other one changing. How, how is that different than realism? Cause that, that conceptual yeah. space where things can change without anything else changing almost yeah. just sounds like it is a universal almost. And yeah. maybe I'm missing something, but. But let's say, you know, when I apply, you know, uh, crumbly and brown to bread, okay, like the surface features of bread. Um, and let's say when I apply it to crumbly, when I apply crumbly and brown to like this bread, you know, like the bread for my peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and then for like the pre consecrated host, and I apply, I guess it's not brown, but crumbly and whatever to crumble, we'll just go crumbly, right? Crumbly. When I apply crumbly yeah, to, to, to the pre-consecrated host. Why do I have to apply those two terms univocally? Why can't we just say, yeah, th I'm applying them based on a kind of like a looser similarity relationship that that's grounded in like prior experience. So, okay. I'm going to struggle with this and I'm going to struggle out loud. So um, bear with yeah, me, yeah, yeah. bear with me. You know, this is going to be, Solomon, I've, I've thought about this for about four seconds my whole life. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm okay. Patient. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess, I guess I'm just wondering, um, when, when we're, when we're discussing, um, transubstantiation, but like trying not to rely on these realist terms, um, mm -hmm. uh, like I, I almost feel like we either fall into like, like it's going to either resolve back into nominalism in some way mm -hmm. or, um, or we're going to kind of wind up with this Jesuit appeal to mystery, which yeah. if you want to make this appeal to mystery, I guess all I can say is like, okay, like I'm not, I'm not willing to meet you there. Um, and yeah. maybe that's because I'm Irish and therefore stubborn, but, um, yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, when, yeah. when you do go ahead and, and make the Jesuit appeal to mystery, um, yeah. I, I kind of shake your hand and I say like, okay, very well. Like, uh, Fair enough, this yeah. this is where we draw the line, kind of, you know. Yeah. Um, but you can only play that card so many times. You start playing it, uh, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, you know, like, I think you get like one good mystery card, and then you got to like. Because there's yeah. there's almost nothing that you couldn't believe based on just an appeal to mystery. Yeah. Almost, it's yeah. like you can believe yeah. anything you want with yeah. an appeal to mystery. It doesn't seem so, like a reliable pathway to truth. Yeah, like I I don't claim to find the transubstantiation story like a terribly satisfying explanation. Whether we interpret predication. Mm -hmm nominalistically or realistically okay because it, it seems to me like when we say transubstantiation like literally what does it mean well the accidents remain the same the underlying substance changes right mm -hmm. and by 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 putting like the the heavy hylomorphic language in there how are we saying anything different that it then that it looks the same but deep down inside it's different and and i am actually super sympathetic to that idea yeah. um and when i talk to so um I, I have a friend, Anthony, who um, himself, he is not a Jesuit himself, but he's just a very, like, um, uh, uh, Jesuit-friendly Catholic, if that makes sure, sense. Sure, sure. Um, oh, yeah. uh, and, and he'll say stuff like that, too. He'll say something to the end. You know, Anthony, if you watch this later and, you know, I'm putting words in your mouth and I do apologize. But he'll say stuff like that was the language of the time. So Trent, you know, was yeah. in the 1500s or whatever. And Aristotelian language was just how we described the world in the 1500s. So that's the language that they used to describe like what happens during transubstantiation, but like, don't get so caught up in that. Um, yeah. The council of Trent wasn't trying to dog dogmatically define um, like literally like Aristotle has to be 100% correct in the way that he defined things 2000 years ago, because we've enshrined it in Trent. No, rather it's just, um, it's just uh, a, way that like that was the language of the day kind of um yeah. and that is something i'm sympathetic to yeah and now i think there are there are catholics out there who would say no 100 percent. you got to say the aristotelian account is like 100 percent correct and like you're basically committed to like aristotle's physics in virtue of this okay <laughs> right um i think so i think that's out there but i mean i'm my point is is like putting it in the aristotelian language does not to me really work as an explanation Right. It's, it, it seems to me it's it's just giving a more sophisticated framing of the problem. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, you, you know what I mean? And so 
Um, so maybe I'm like going Jesuit and playing the mystery card here, right? Okay, but I think like, like I don't, I, I don't find this transubstantiation account to like shed much light mm. in terms of explanation. Okay, um, and so and like and there's other accounts like you've got like like Leibniz has it. I, I'd be loath to remember, it, but he's got what I remember, you know, in principle being like an interesting account as transubstantiation, right? Like he's trying to like you know like make up with catholics in a lot of ways right and and so there's other accounts right um but i think they all for me end up just saying well the surface features are 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 the same and, and the 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 inner essence of the thing is different um so i don't but i don't think that's an explanation that's just a, a renaming of the problem okay yeah they 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 see a problem and they're kind of just um like grasping at the problem and parsing the problem in the language of the day yeah, but they're not—they're yeah. not saying for sure that this is what it is. Like, hey, guys, we figured it out. It's the substances yeah. that are changing. No, it's I mean, okay. It, like, how is that not a non-trivial claim than to say the substance changes and the accidents are different? Just to say the outer appearance is the same and the inner inner reality of it is different. Well, that's that's not an explanation. That's just that's a claim. Right. Yeah. The only the only reason you saw me kind of go like this for a second there yeah. was just because I I do want to call it non trivial in the sense in which it was um, yeah. defined. So just in an in a council in yeah. the council of trends because because it's saying you got to believe uh, this thing changed. Yes. Yes. For real. Yeah. You got to say that. Mm -hmm. You got to. It's it's re, it's in the language in the in the best available scientific language of the time. It's saying. The dogma is this thing really changes, yeah. Right, in in this like metaphysically robust way, that yeah. is being said there, yeah. Mm -hmm. But to get like talk about in terms of substance and accident and all that, I don't think that explains anything. It's just a way of putting your foot down on it. Yeah, right. I right. do. I do think, and this is not a topic that like you and I need to get deep into. But I do think that this yeah. um, like admission of like. Hey, look, the Aristotelian language that was used at the Council of Trent is really just the language of the day and we need to like look past it. I do think that that like opens up like an interesting can of worms for like how we should be looking at like infallible Catholic teaching like today. Oh yeah, totally. Totally. Um, yeah. And and um like it's it's you know, all of a sudden the Jesuits seem like they start making a lot of sense, you know, with like a lot of the stuff that they're saying. And yeah. uh and who knows? Maybe well, in a hundred years we're all yeah. Jesuits, but, um, <laughs> okay. but you and, know, yeah, right. I mean, I, I have I have this kind of Wittgensteinian way of looking at this, right? And um, you know, and Wittgensteinian and Wittgenstein, you know, um, you know, had had some like interesting Catholic allies, right? Okay, but um, anyway, but that that's not the point. Is look, I, I think I don't. I think it might be that something like this thing becomes the body of the second person of the Trinity is just not something humans can make any sense of whatsoever. This okay. is in the Uber Umwelt. Yeah, exactly. It's so it's like a claim on the Uber Umwelt. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's beyond like, it's beyond what apes like us have evolved to be able to like deal with. Okay. Um, and so for me, like what then counts for believing something that is in principle beyond the human can. Right? How how do you believe that? How like yeah. how can yeah. you even? Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. I think there's a mystery yeah. to that. Okay. All right. And it seems to me, in you know, I actually um, I do have a paper on my uh, Substack where I, I talk about religious belief and like distinguishing it at the physiological level, the behavioral level, and the content, the conceptual level. Right. And I think these all three can like operate somewhat independently of each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think something like, you know, transubstantiation or the real presence, I probably I would prefer to say. Right. Maybe something that w it's not possible for us to have content about. So what counts for believing it is behavioral. Mm. Right. The fact that you find yourself on Sunday showing up fasted. Right. To do this is what it is to believe it. Right? OK. That you are thereby inclined to so behave. Right is mysterious to you okay something you don't you can't make terribly good sense of but you but you show up fasted prepared taken seriously i don't know what really counts for believing in the real presence but that okay 
matter. I, yeah, and you know, I think I'm I think I'm sympathetic to that. If and I, I may have just got myself fired, I don't know. <laughs> but they're, but they're, they're going, right? Okay. Well, <laughs> right, right. well, let me. But for the, for the record, I show up fasted, ready to go. Yeah, right? and and yeah. and yeah. let me let me like um, you know, put on my Catholic hat for a second and, yeah, yeah. and kind yeah. of maybe just like defend your definition of belief as a behavior. Um, yeah. if um, if this, uh, if belief can really be a behavior, then I, I think that I'm pretty okay with saying something like with, like, I don't think I'm going to get all up in somebody's face if when they say that they believe in transubstantiation. Or, well, well, nominalism is true. What are you talking about? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do that. If, if what they mean is, well, I act as if it's true. Like I, like my behaviors change because of it. And so even if I don't really have like just a brain that's capable of really understanding it, then I'm just going to, I'm going to show up fasted anyway. Yeah. I don't really yeah. have a problem with that. I don't think. Right. Um, yeah. Well, what would it be to have a problem with that? There's just a question. Yeah. Do you find yourself inclined or not? Right. Right. And whether you find yourself inclined, I find like completely mysterious. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Not in like a, like a wooey sense, but like, like, who knows why really someone is so inclined or not inclined. I don't think any of us knows that about ourselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. If you don't mind, we've been, mm -hmm. we've been kind of on this, uh, like Catholicism, nominalism, realism, um, yeah. transubstantiation thing for a little while now. Um, mm -hmm. another part of my video, uh, the, the video that I called the nominalism phobia, um, was about, <laughs> um, I, love that. I, I guess kind of two things. One being, um, the the blame that nominalism gets for everything that's yeah. ever gone wrong ever but then the other thing too is just like the nature of of like um uh like motivation in the first place i i said that yeah. i i didn't spend long on it but i just called it like deeply implausible that anybody actually ever does anything because nominalism like i don't yes. i just don't think that's how humans work i guess yeah, yeah. um yeah this, this, about this is where i want to go yeah, yeah this is where i wanted to go mm -hmm. in the whole conversation cool. right because this is kind of my my jam yeah right <laughs> Right. As you know. So, okay. I, I guess if, if you got me to quit being, you know, like so aloof and like hippie and like <laughs> got me to sit down and like, like do some metaphysics, I would probably come out as some kind of realist. Okay. okay? Uh, all right. But it would take so much to get me to do that because I don't think it matters all that much. Mm. All right. And I think, I think the whole claim, the whole like nomalism phobia, phobia, right, that, that you've talked about, or like what I like to talk about is like nominalism as the boogeyman, right? I think it really misunderstands how human cognition actually works for the most part. Yes. Right. Okay. And I think it way overestimates. If you're going to say like, like the reason, you know, we think it's okay to marry a chicken now or something like that is because nominalism, it's way overestimate. That's kind of the claim, right? Right. right? Okay. Right. It's, it's way overestimating the role that explicit rational inference actually plays in guiding our behavior okay and this is where i think david hume is rather very interesting and i think you can see a similarity between people like david hume and some of like the later phenomenologists that i take very serious like merleau ponty okay not that not that like like monty's a merleau ponty's a uh, humean empiricist or something like that right but so Hume makes like his anomalous case, you know, about like causation, like okay, there's no absolute universal that can like ground causal inferences. So what he then says is, but, but you find yourself like when, when I say, you know, put the snowball in the fire, you cannot help but think that it's going to melt, even though Hume thinks he's shown you there's no absolute universal grounding for that inference. Right. But he says, but look, you can't help but make the inference. Okay. And so on Hume's view, then it's well, it must be that what's pushing you isn't this sort of conscious reasoning process. It's a natural disposition. OK, and those natural dispositions really work well for us. OK, so he's saying like, yeah, like you think something really rides on this realist account. But let's just say, OK, we like we convince you that realism isn't true. Are you going to seriously entertain now? Right, that your inference that the snowball is going to melt is invalid. You're not. No. You can't help it. No. it, it it's hardwired. Right? right. And he does the same thing in his ethics. Right. He says, now look, you know, I, he says, you know, there's absolutely no universal grounding, like the prohibition of murder, I think is his example. Right. But then he's like, but you're not going to go stab your neighbor now because you have a natural aversion to this. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. 
just to yeah, go ahead. real quick, sorry, I didn't want yep. to cut you off, but yep. um, I, so growing up like pretty radical trad, um, yeah. it was 100% the case that we were taught that like, you know, uh, as soon as you stop believing in like, like God forbid, if you actually thought that God was like, you know, not Trinitarian anymore, like if you just be like, oh, you're going to go murder your neighbor because then, yeah. you know, anything yeah. goes. Um, yeah. And it's so funny, like in hindsight, that's just not the way that humans work. Like, that's just not how we are. It's not. It's not. I mean, it's missing the fact, like like uh, Carl Jung in a really interesting essay he wrote fairly late called um, On the Nature of Psyche. He calls it like the philosopher's fallacy. And it's this way overestimation of, of, of explicit consciousness as what actually guides our behavior, right? And really, most of what guides our behavior is unconscious, and it, I, it comes yeah. to us as a as a matter of our, our like biological cultural inheritance. Okay, now, and so I might agree a lot with like what some of the nominalist phobes see as like you know like like things going badly culturally, right? But is that because like we've we don't have like a second order account about like what grounds rational inference, or is it because we've undercut the cultural conditions that allow our subconscious to work in the way it's supposed to work. I am more inclined to think the latter rather than the former, right? It's not like a bunch of like bad philosophy really had that much influence on the culture, right? Yeah. Or I'd like to see the sociology that shows that. Okay. It's that we have under undermined the conditions under which human rationality actually gets learned and actually gets like put into us and 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 the grounding conditions human rationality right and not because somehow right we're like like all consciously nominalistic right yeah um something that i said in my video was something to the effect that i i just found it super implausible that anybody would like list nominalism as something that actually um uh like motivates any kind of behavior at all um partial in part because i think so few people actually know what nominalism and realism are and yeah. this doesn't just apply to the people who are like lukewarm about their religion i think that there are very um uh like devout religious people who just don't get into the philosophy side of of religion um yeah. like there's you know I, I think about um somebody like my grandpa very devout catholic irish immigrant has no idea what nominalism is no and he doesn't right. care like you know it, it, yep. whatever um he yep. grew up on a farm in ireland like uh yep. so i you know just the idea that um like he wouldn't list his belief in universals as like the reason he does anything um right and, and right. i understand that the claim here you and, know i'm straw manning the people who make yeah, these claims yeah, yeah, a little bit yeah. um because they would claim something to the effect of like, well, you don't have to know what it is to have it motivate your behaviors. And some people really, but that, that's, that's my, that's my point though. Yeah. That's my point. Like, <laughs> you know, like what's motivating our behaviors is not necessarily what is transparently available to us in our conscious reasoning processes. Like that, that's, and you know, so yeah, may, maybe like, cause of certain things that it go on in like esoteric levels of the university, it's kind of through a long process trickle down to the culture. Sure. Maybe. I'd like to see the sociology on that actually. Okay. But moreover, that kind of makes my point is that like what moves us isn't whether or not we are operating by the right explicitly held deductively sound syllogisms. That's not what moves humans for yeah. the most part. Right. Humans are surprisingly, or actually not surprisingly, if you've met a few humans, not very rational all the time. And, yeah. And yeah. we, we and, hold in, in, yeah. I mean, and I think all, a lot of the psychology and cognitive science shows that like we are, we are mainly operated to like, like set up to operate in contexts of social trust. Right. And where we can like depend on conformity to get us by. Right. And we can depend on like our natural dispositions to get us by without actually a whole lot of like deliberative moral dilemma kind of like worry. Right. Um, and I think a lot of this just takes like tough cases and makes bad law, right? Um, do, do, do you see that? And, and and I think we're also dealing with, and I'm this is like self-confessional, a bunch of like, you know, academic philosophers and theologians who would like to think like what we do is like of like world cultural importance, and maybe it's not, right? <laughs> you, know what you, you know what I mean? I find it important, but um, but maybe um, 
maybe maybe important doesn't necessarily mean that it's a motivating behavior for most people's day to day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, you know what I mean? I think, you know, and I don't want to like psychologize too much mm-hmm. on other people's positions. Right. But, but, and so, and, and, and to me, I think if we're going to make these claims that something like, you know, nominalism is, is what's undoing, then that better square with what we know about how human behavior actually operates and like what actually motivates and stuff like that. And I just don't think that squares really well with what we're learning from social psychology, from cognitive science, from attachment theory, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just like all the science that's come out in recent years about how like people make decisions before they even realize that they've made decisions, I think is like yeah. super interesting and kind of would make you look at these claims that like nominalism is what's driving people to, you know, want to have relationships with chickens or whatever. Yeah. I, like and you'd yeah. go like, "Well, I don't I don't think that's right. I don't think that's the case." Yeah. And, and look, I, I mean, and, and it might be it look like maybe, you know, humans want to have relationships with chickens or what have you because like we are you know, we're good conformers and we mostly operate without explicit syllogisms and stuff like yeah. that. And so we're very easily influenced. I, I think there's something to that, but also like what's going to actually, what kept us going in a different direction where like the chickens were verboten. Well, it was because we're good conformers and like, we're very easy to manipulate stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, but I think there's this like really troubling thing we don't want to admit about ourselves is that we're not really nearly in as much conscious control of ourselves as we'd like to believe we are. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and we don't have to get into this either, but that's also something else that like really troubled me when I was like particularly, um, like radical trad, um, yeah. uh, the, the like libertarian free will was pretty, um, like important to the nom uh, to the, to the, to the, to the like rad trad conception of hell and how many people yeah. go there and how, it, how everyone deserves it and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah. but that's a whole other can of worms yeah, for, yeah, for a whole yeah. other day. But, but yeah. yeah um, yeah. Yeah. When, uh, when you reached out to me about my, the, the, the nominalism video and you said that you agreed with the point about how that isn't like a motivating factor really for anybody. Um, you made yeah. my, you made my week. You really did. Like I was, really? I, was I was so happy. <laughs> yeah. I was like, cause yeah. I hadn't really heard anybody on YouTube talking about this. Um, and I was like, yeah. I just, I just find that super implausible. Let me make a video about it and see how like well received it is. And it generated a lot of discussion, which is all that I was going for. Um, that's cool. And plenty of people disagreeing with me, which is fine. That's why I made the channel. Like I made the channel to talk to people who disagree with me. But when you reached out to me and you said that, like, yeah, I, I, I think you're onto something with the motivational, behavioral part of it. That yeah, you really I did agree. make my week. But cool. Thank you, man. Glad to do it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, but but that leads me to to another question. Um. I'll refer to them as your compatriots, but I don't, they're not really your compatriots. There's a lot of um, Catholic um, uh, PhDs and professors, um, mm-hmm. some of whom I quoted in that video, who do want to argue that, um, that nominalism is what is like, you know, quote, destroying the worldview of, of like, you know, the West. And there's, there's this big tie in like, you know, all of the West's moral um, foundations are tied up in like a robust realism. Um, and, um, it sounds like you and I agree that um, like accepting nominalism really has nothing to do with your behavior. Um, what, do, what do you take it? Uh, how do you take the claim that like uh, the moral foundations of the West are built upon a robust realism? I unsurprisingly, I don't yeah. find that convincing. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm not convinced by that. Right. And like, I, I guess, you know, that wouldn't necessarily make realism true though. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it was bound up, it's it's not. Okay. It could turn out. It's really bad if nominalism is true. Okay. It could be really, really bad. And it could be true that nominalism nominalism could be true. true. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I I don't want often when I hear those kinds of, you hear those like, okay, you know, arguments that, well, you know, if, if there is no God, then like all of our institutions are going to go down the toilet right or if nominalism is true then all our institutions are going on the toilet okay fine fine all right and so agrees frederick nietzsche he just doesn't think there's a god right okay I mean, that, that's unfair to Nietzsche, actually but but you know what i mean or you know so says you know so, so here's occam say it agrees so hume agrees but they're like well what do you want me to do like i can't make that be true okay mm-hmm. and so i think there's a question like whether or not nominalism is tr- true that is independent from 
how dear it would be to us that it be false, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know I mean? And it might be dear. I'm not, you know, it might be, I, I'm not convinced that it is. Cause once again, I think nature does more work for us than we want to admit oh. that it does. Oh yeah. Right? Okay. Um, but it might be dear to us and it might be true. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Not yeah. my view actually. Right. But yeah. Yeah. Um, right. I, I do think that um, there's a lot. So um, not, not Catholics as much, but, um, there's this one really good, he's a Christian, just not a Catholic Christian. Um, his name is, uh, Dr. Kenny Boyce and, um, he, okay. he's a nominalist. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah. uh, he, he does a lot of, um, interesting articles on how like theism and nominalism play totally fine together. Like, um, so I do yeah. think that like Catholic Christians, um, and Catholic Christians and anybody else who feels like this, I, I do think that there's like this huge overstatement of the role of nominalism in somebody's like uh, just worldview at large, really. Like the fact yeah. that like Martin Luther himself was fairly nominalistic. Now he did change his mind a lot, like, you know, during his life, but, and like the idea that like Martin Luther wasn't um, like key to the moral development of the West is like absurd. Like, Protestantism yeah. plays a huge role in the moral development of the West. Like a huge role. Yeah. Like, you know, Catholics might not yeah. like to admit it, but Protestantism is, is a huge yeah. part of European history. Um, yeah, exactly. And a large swath of Protestants I are mean, nominalists. Look, I mean, you don't get the Enlightenment without it. Right. right. And, you know, without the Enlightenment, I always wonder, like, would my daughter have been taught to read? Right. So, like, you know, some kind of. Yeah. Here. And that's yeah. Um, yeah. that's one of my. So I. I we're kind of getting off into the weeds here, but this stuff is interesting. One of my biggest gripes with um, like trad Catholics in particular is um, this like aversion and like hatred for the enlightenment. They view the enlightenment as like the death of, of civilization. And like, it's all been downhill since the enlightenment, yeah. um, which is 100% tied to the fact that the enlightenment is like mostly a Protestant um, invention. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I just think that's wild. Cause like you said, you know, yeah. So, so much of Western morals, including like, you know, women's rights comes from yeah. like yeah. enlightenment era principles. And, and I think, you know, here on the, on the far side of Hiroshima, we can't say like the enlightenment has been an unmitigated good either. Right. Okay. It, you know, so and, let me, yeah. let me ask you though, what do you mean? Um, like, do you think that Hiroshima was some kind, like, was like a fruit of the enlightenment in a way? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think, I think, I think that that disenchantment of nature that is like hand in glove with the enlightenment, right. Um, is a necessary constituent for us to get to a point Mm. like that. Okay. But also I think it's, I think also, you know, the enlightenment is necessary condition for us to get to, you know, uh, women's equality. Okay. You you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, Charles Taylor is really, I, I really recommend his book, um, the ethics of authenticity. Okay. Where he, he argues really well that I think I think he uses the term like you've got enlightenment boosters, enlightenment knockers, right? And his point is like they're both like really facile positions. Like like the whole like anyone who has like a wholesale rejection of the enlightenment is it's just at this point it's performatively inconsistent because we all draw on the enlightenment every day, right? anyone who says the enlightenment has been an unmitigated good is not really paying attention to like the history of the 20th century. Right. And, and seeing like, like, okay. And in another, in a really interesting paper, which uh, Taylor wrote called a Catholic modernity question mark. He says like the embarrassment to Christianity is that it kind of took the enlightenment to tell us what our ethic actually was, which is like every person counts, meaning, every person okay the embarrassment to the enlightenment is you still need christianity kind of to tell you why you should give a damn about that in taylor's view huh okay so for him there's this and this is no accident he's 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 basically again there's a hegelian dialectic between christianity and the enlightenment okay and they're kind of that you have to hold them together in like a ever unhappy tension (laughs) in many ways or like he thinks we're working that out still okay um but i do like that like look yeah i mean like to say that we didn't like Christianity didn't get kind of taught by something by the counter movement, I think is, is hard to deny, but also like there is, there is the sneaking. If God is dead, all things are permitted thing, right. That is, is a problem that comes up again and again for the enlightenment. Okay. And the disenchantment of nature and and, and all that. Okay. So, and, and Taylor will say is like, you also have to see 
and this is like like Nietzsche's point, that the Enlightenment is not entirely untutored by Christianity. Okay, okay, and um, the emphasis on truthfulness and the emphasis on a nature that like we can understand independently of like pagan belief and stuff like that, you know, that plays a role in the coming of the Enlightenment. So it's all wound up like like much more tightly in like the crossovers and all that are much more complicated than any easy story of like enlightenment bad like christendom good christendom bad and light right. good and i think in either direction i think people like taylor have done a lot to like get us to see um it's a much more complicated story than all that cool right um dr madden i've kept you for an hour i've got at least one question from the chat if you have the time yeah. to okay so the one question was so um we've got and you'll have to forgive me i don't know how to actually highlight the the chat on the screen i have to figure that out yeah, so. um but well, thank um, god i'm not running the tech on this because we would never get <laughs> this thing up let's go. you and i are right on the same page there dr jim i uh, i'm not good with youtube but um yeah. uh natheist which i think it's a hilarious name I assume, awesome. I assume yeah. he's nate um uh, wanted to ask, he asked a question. I'm going to direct it at you because you're the philosopher in the room. So um, he just said, what philosophers should he read if he wants to learn more about nominalism? He says, I know you mentioned Hume, but who, but who else? Okay, so uh, it, that's an interesting question. I think, now this is not an introduction to the medieval problem of universals, but there's a great little book by a guy named David Armstrong. Okay. Uh, someone with whom in general I could not disagree with more. Okay, but um, it's he has this he he wrote this really wonderful little book. It's called uh, Universals and Opinionated Introduction, which I highly recommend. And you'll get a great layout of like the state of the debate, at least as it was like 20 years ago in analytic philosophy, but it's probably still basically right. And kind of a sense of what the positions are and what's at stake. I would really recommend like having when I taught a course on the medieval problem, universals. I used that book just to get the, the youngsters off the ground on the issue, right? So I recommend that. And then if you want to wade into the actual um, medieval text, there's a guy named Paul Spade has uh, a little book with Hackett, which Hackett always publishes stuff very cheaply called uh, Universals, the Medieval Universals, the five texts. And you get you get excerpts from Abelard, you get excerpts from, scotus from Occam, from thomas right and it's, it's pretty it's pretty manageable so i would look at that right and at one point i don't know if he still has it paul spade used to have an awesome website on uh the medieval problem universals right and yeah so i think those are probably some good materials to start with i'll see yeah. if i can find it and if it is still there i'll put it in the description to this video for anybody who wants to yeah. watch later yeah but when i when i was in grad school that was like the uh that was like the the hack code to the to, to the comprehensive exam on, on, on the universals, right? Was Paul Spade's webpage, right? So. Cool. Um, yep. I've got one last question for you, Dr. Yeah. Jim, and it's, me, it, this is the, the, um, the, the, the eternal last question. What's new, what you got working on? Um, I've, I'm going yeah. to be linking to your sub stack down below too, cool. so that everyone can subscribe. Um, but, yeah. but what else you got going on? Yeah. So I just, um, Okay, actually, I did a uh, lecture for the Thomistic Institute and then did a follow-up podcast with Father Gregory Pine on free will. But really, that dovetails with what we talked about here because in that, in, that, in that paper and in the subsequent conversation, I'm trying to motivate the degree to which conscious decision-making is less important to mm. us than you might want to think. Okay, so you might look for that, right? Cool. Um, my conversation with Father Pine on the TI podcast right? that's so cool and I, i'm i watch like almost everything that father pine puts out is that is, is this yeah. video out already it's out yeah it's out it's on it's, youtube it's on youtube i'll send I, you I the link yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm gonna link yeah. it down below too yeah. i don't think i've seen that yeah. one yet um but i father pine is on um on uh, uh matt frad's show like is on a really? weekly basis i think um cool and i or at least he used to be on there on a weekly basis and so i, yeah. I used to watch all of those and i am subscribed to the Thomistic institute too um, sure. And I love them because I, I, I said at the beginning, and I'll say it again, I'm not that bright. And the Thomistic Institute has like, does a really good job of, um, taking kind of tough concepts and making them a lot more digestible. Yeah, they um, do. They do. Right. So I'm, and I'm a I just fan. did a, I just did a, a Thomistic Institute lecture at North Carolina state this week, last oh. week and, um, on artificial intelligence. Ooh. And a lot of these, yeah, a lot of these ideas that we talked about today are actually in play in that lecture. So that will eventually drop on SoundCloud 
uh, and Spotify and all that. So have a look at, like, keep an eye out for that on the TI. Other than that, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of cranking my Substack stuff out. Um, so I've got one more piece on UFOs that I should be done with, nice. like, maybe even today. I think that's my last UFO piece. And I've, okay. I've done, I've done that. <laughs> um, we'll see. That, and, then, and then the next one I'm going to do is going to be on um, the Prometheus myth and Plato's account of Atlantis and the Critias. So, so huh. another, Ooh. like, yeah, another, another weird one coming to you. So yeah. that's awesome. All right. I'm going to keep my eyes open for those two. Do it. Uh, Dr. Madden, this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Anytime, Kevin. I love, I, I, I so support what you're doing in this channel. Thank I think you. what you're doing is awesome. Right. Uh, I think it's the kind of conversation we shouldn't be afraid to have. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? I think you're modeling like how to be a decent dude, uh, <laughs> like while, while trying to like, like look for clues at the scene of the crime. Right. So yeah. Thanks. Well that, that really means a lot coming from you. I try to be like a foil. Like there's a lot of really, really good Catholic content creators out there. Um, yeah. And I, I just saw like a void that wasn't there. And so I kind of figured, Hey, maybe I can just be a foil to all of the Catholic content creators and see if I can't just give something for everyone to think about. Um, and so your, your words mean like a lot to me because you're the real deal, and I'm just some kid with the podcast Thank you, on YouTube. So. I, mean, I mean, think of it. Think, just go back to what we said earlier. Like, think of like, like, like Taylor's view is like, until Christianity had like this other challenge, it didn't really know what it was about, mm -hmm. right? It's this is like the Hegelian point, and until the Enlightenment like sees Christianity as an other challenging it, it doesn't really know what it's about, and so there is this interdependence of the opponents in the debate, right? Yes, and I think until we see that. Like, like completely silencing your other would not actually be good for you, right? I think yes. that's really important to realize. Yeah. yeah, and I'm happy to play whatever role I can in, uh, you know, the 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 interplay between the the you know, if if I can represent the Enlightenment and if if yeah. Catholic content creators want to represent Catholicism yeah. and then we can learn from each other. That's all I can. Yeah hope for and yeah. and i'm trying to represent the synthesis so there yes go, right? yes <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, right, yeah. and yeah. uh my friend sj in the comments asked if dr jim is a catholic dr jim is a catholic dr jim te yeah. teaches at benedictine um a yeah. catholic yeah. phd I, philosopher so. exactly yeah i'm i'm, yeah. I'm you know, i went to mass this morning not that like that's like a credential or something like that right but no i'm i'm yeah i'm, I'm a catholic yeah, yeah. cool Dr. Jim, uh, another awesome episode. I love talking to you. I learn so much every time I do. Yeah. Um, and hopefully the Anytime, audience liked it too. Yep. Cool. Thanks, Dr. Jim. Okay. I just hit end. Cool. That was that awesome. Was fun, man. Yeah.